So how's it going? It's going really great. And and thank you so much for making this time. I'm I'm really happy to to talk with you. You really, you know, you you've always been one of my favorite YouTubers going all the way back. In some way, you were the inspiration for me opening the channel. I mean, I really enjoyed your channel way back, you know, over 10 years ago now. Uh, you know, what, what I wanted to do today, and mm -hmm. well, it started with the the politics of death video that you had posted a while back, maybe about a week or so ago. Yeah. And I was going to post a response. And then Spirit Science had posted up a video on near-death experiences. And then right. now I've seen you done, you have done a couple of video responses uh, kind of on this David Long, uh, mm. this issue of emergentism versus panpsychism. Yes. I would like to go back to this original issue that you raised in the politics of death and see if we can talk a little bit about some of what's going on there and then see sort of where it takes us. Is that? That's great. Yeah. I'd love to, to try to, all those things are intimately connected and to be able to draw out yeah. the connections would be uh, a lot of fun. So I'm offering this up as I think, you know, in, in the spirit of, you know, of, of open inquiry and, and honesty about what I, what I seem to think, what seems to be the case, and what, you know, I guess we really don't know. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways that we could come at some of these, you know, these different questions and concerns. Mm -hmm. But it would be, I mean, one way that I would want to come into it is in, in response to your politics of death, I would say, yes, there is a great concern over the meaning of death as it gets caught within an overly circumscribed individualism. As mm -hmm. once people have they've misunderstood organismal integrity with something like radical independence of the organism. Like as if the mm -hmm. organism is independent of an, its environment just because it maintains something like an organismal integrity. And I think right. you know, for me, the, the, the quest would be, you know, to maximize one's, we'll call it spiritual potency or one's recognition of the sacredness of existence it has to do with this discovery of who one really is and that right. one is a place and moment of everything that's ever existed. Mm -hmm. And, and so as I think as soon as one like sheds the false ego, the false sense of self that comes from like a visual bias of trusting that the eyes are the true register of what boundaries are. As soon as you start to realize that the word, the spoken word opens one's opens one up to historical dimensions, to dimensions of depth and that, that are unseen. They're not really material in the same way that we think about something that is visual, that can be put on a scale, that can be subject to compositional analysis. And its materiality is basically subject to, again, this kind of reductivism. You know, I think, and let me, let me say one last thing about this and, and this, and I'll, I'll sort of see what you want to say to any of that, but it's that I think, you know, one of the simple ways to come at it, even from like, um, like a rudimentary biological orientation is to say to someone, okay, what will you do with the fact of genitalia? Because now you can look at your body and ask, how does your genitalia relate to the rest of the body and how are the hormones related and all of the organs relate to one another? But you're never going to understand genitalia by just looking at the isolated individual separated at the skin. I mean, that kind of empiricism is going to wholly miss the kind of the deep profound sociality that's etched in our body, not only with the fact that we have navels, but the fact that we've come, you know, into the world by coming out of another person, like literally come into the world by coming out of another person, but that we then bear organs that we call private parts, but are really the ultimately social parts of our being. And it's, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's a statement that we call them our private parts because we withhold our sociality because we try to define ourselves as these kind of atomistic individuals located, you know, again, at the boundaries of the skin or something like that. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's a wonderful, um sort of preamble to enter into this conversation. And uh, I really appreciate everything um, that you're saying and would want to, um, to echo it. Uh, you know, there's deep agreement there. Um, and so I think what you're describing, how I would maybe rephrase it would be to say that in the modern period where individualism became basically the religion for modern societies, 
um, liberal societies, I guess communism was an alternative, which had more of a sense of collective identity. But even there, there was a sense of the individual life as um, ceasing at death and that whatever we are is somehow limited to the body, um, the individual body. And um, I think in, in the whole history of human culture, the changing relationship to death and understanding of what happens when you die is one of, it seems to be at the bit, you know, as Ernest Becker and other anthropologists have said, our relationship to death seems to be at the base of our cultural, uh, of our cultures and our, of our sense of um, what is meaningful ultimately. And so how we respond to the fact of death is what gives us our sense of meaning and purpose. And death is the end of human life in many senses of end, as in it is only through death and engaging with the mystery of death that we can find purpose. And in the modern individualist context, um, it becomes difficult to find meaning in the face of death that isn't just um, basically uh, greed and, and, and hedonism. See, I, and so what, what you're pointing to is the deeper social ground that, for example, if we even just look at our bodies, our sex organs, are, they're not our private parts. I love that. They're actually the most transpersonal uh, of our organs. And actually, there's an interesting symmetry here that I think, um, you know, it may make, you know, again, modern Protestant, but uh, so all patriarchal culture might blush and feel shame about this, but there's a profound symmetry in the body developmentally um, in, between the, the genitalia and the face. And like the, the sensory organs of the face and the sexual, the, the way that the bottom half of the body is structured, these are, these are sprung from the same, uh, you know, growth forms that shape, you that's know, the human body. So you're right. Okay. No, that, I think that's exactly right. So let's, mm -hmm. let's chase that down. Okay. Now that, that's a good way to come at it. And this is where, when people try to reduce it all down to the brain, it gets all confusing. Not only is the brain multimodular, but the body has an array of different sensory motor capacities. And it includes the different senses traditionally defined like sight and hearing and touch, but it includes the kind of space and time dynamics of the possibilities of reproduction or the fact that we need to sleep or that we always have to have food chains at a certain distance from ourselves and we metabolize the things at a certain rate. I mean, like the boundaries of the skin are such, they're so illusory and the eye is so easily fooled. This is how you get people thinking they're gonna gallivant around the stars. You know, they're, they're missing all the ways in which you need the atmospheric pressure, the, the gravitational constants that are here relative to this mass of this planet. Like when you jump up and down, you're actually affecting the gravity of the earth. We uh, do the equation. I mean, it's actually in there, you know? I mean, yeah. we, we're more cosmic than I think we, we recognize. And there is an integrity to the body, but what we need to go to is this kind of world openness that comes from the different sense modalities. So this would be a different way to sort of echo what you were saying, but again, I would try to further it out this way. So, you know, this is the, the Archimedes, right? The great discovery of how you can measure the volume of a complex object like the crown, right? He sets it in the water and then it displaces a certain amount of water. And he says, look, this is the volume that this thing occupies. But if I ask about a living body, see, this is where the panpsychism starts. To, I mean, you can tell I'm angling in on the panpsychism. <laughs> uh -huh. When I talk about the, the crown, I can understand that object that is subject to a kind of reductive compositional analysis. And I can say I comprehend the whole of the crown by submerging it and then showing the amount of water displaced and saying that's how it's occupying space. But mm -hmm. me, my body, all of us, not only did we grow out of another person through nutritive commerce and metabolism and, and really very complicated processes, unlike that crown. But oh, yeah. I say that I occupy space. 
I don't occupy space in a way that a thing does. Like I could take this pen and I can put it in a drawer, but it doesn't feel the confinement of the space. Whereas a living organism, it's due to its sensory capacities, its mo sensory motor capacities. So, and it's not just representational. This is absolutely crucial. I think this is one of the biggest failures is for people to imagine that everything is just representational. Now, once you move to the difference between seeing, hearing, and touch, you realize that, okay, like my eyes right now are registering and they're representing the distances I am from the wall, but my legs do a lot more than represent that distance. They're the, they're the source of those distances that I can take myself closer to or further away from that. And to that extent, motility, the fact that my body has a directionality, that my hands have things within certain reach and there's a sort of spatial temporal dynamic to that. And then hearing has a dynamic that intersects with that and then vision has an intersect and then once you get language that comes back in and, and then communication technologies start looping back and double backing over you get mm -hmm. this massive intersecting dynamic of of modes of space and time where yeah. And we ask this question about consciousness and where does it start? How did it begin? Though that part of us, which is asking that question is a highly mediated social historical accomplishment. It already depends upon calendars, awareness of yeah, things. Yeah. So let me. These and religions and. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let me, um, I want to get to the panpsychism issue and because I certainly don't think that um, a crown or any artifact is conscious or has a soul or anything like that. Um, but, and, I, and I, what you're saying about space time and the way that living organisms sort of bring forth their own space time envelopes and that the organism and the environment are actually part of their one system. Life is the system of yeah. relationship between organism and environment um, and organisms and one another. But so um, the sex organs, right? There's something about the sex organs that connect us to a transpersonal past and future. And there's something about the sense organs that connect us more to a personal sense of here and now. And then language though, allows us then to reconnect consciously to that, the way that our sex organs connect us to a deeper past and a, and a future language then I think in a way is again, if, if these, um, if you think of the top and the bottom half of the body as uh, just grown from the same root and in a way fractally repeating one another, language takes on, language is, is profoundly, um, the logos has this erotic and sexual dimension to it that is connecting us through time in a way that I think is closer to the way that um, our genitalia are connecting us through time than it is to the way that our sense organs are connecting us to the here and now. Like language takes us out of the here and now of the sensory present and puts us in touch with, I think, that deeper dimension of reality that our, our sex organs connect us to and our genes connect us to unconsciously. Does that make sense? Speak and sperm, they come from common roots. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Oh, for yeah. sure. There's, you're, you, you screw with people's heads when you talk with them. Literally, you're, you're, it, there's a fecundity that comes from the sowing of seeds. I mean, the dissemination, you know, these are all models that are, you know, this, you know, some way to talk about communication in terms of. So doesn't it feel like culture uh, in general, but it, like especially um, modern uh, individualist cultures are, they react against that with this sort of like shame or this sense of like um, an unwillingness to, to recognize the way in which we are not just ourselves. Yes. Um, and that we are constantly involved in these acts of um, generation with one another. Yeah. Uh, so like, uh, okay, let's get at that. So, I mean, I think mm -hmm. I want to go back to the, the sex and the touch stuff and, and the sight versus hearing and then language, uh, because I think, you know, a lot of this, you know, I think, you know, I, I, I do have a new book that's coming out. It's hopefully be out in December and I'm, I'm trying to bring the cost down right now, haggling with the publisher. At any rate, I'm really excited about it, but it's on non-being. It's about how non-being haunts being. So some of the th examples, these things that I'm talking about are from the book, you know, mm -hmm. let this genitalia stuff and this, but I mean, oh, I, nice. you know, one of the ways to get at it is to show that there are different 
there's differences between actualities and possibilities and the different senses have different domains and ranges of possibilities and language opens up even, you know, a, a wider range of kinds of temporal possibilities rather than just like organismal possibilities in space. The way that like the eye and the ear as the predator and prey sense allow for hunting down a prey and or eluding a predator. But you know, when you, when you try to think about something like touch, you know, it sounds crazy to say it, but think about it. Touch has no possibilities. Touch is absolutely actual at all points. It's that part of you which is wholly, fully actual. And you're always standing somewhere. You're always sitting somewhere. You're always in contact. Now, you could see, like right now, I can, I can see this. I don't know if you can see. I got, I got a pen in my hand. Mm -hmm. But see possibilities of where I can move it with my hand, but my hand moves wherever it moves. Now, mm. you can get it. You know, somebody might try to force this and go, oh, well, sight is just nothing more than a field of actualities as much as the field of action is. And I'd say, blah. Yeah, these are not good phenomenologists. These are people overly with neuromania. They, they have way reduced the complexity of human experience down to the way it comes out in the brain scan and not really registered the phenomenological differences between those spatial temporal horizons of sight, those of hearing and those of touch. So mm -hmm. as I say, you know, I think sight offers this vast expanse of possibilities. It's why it makes athletic competitions so fun to watch. You can see all the possibilities that people People are managing you know when you throw a dart you're the dart only the, the world of touch that leaves your hand and it lands wherever it does but you can see all the places where you wanted it to land or where it didn't land or where it could have or should have you mm -hmm. know so i think once once you deal with the issue of possibilities now you have a non-materialist non-reductive move and i think this is one of the real accomplishments of deacon's incomplete nature is that he does deal with possibilities being part of what makes things happen that is you know a, a, a possible state a goal or an intended state even if it's never actualized can be part of what made the thing do what it is and let me say one last thing on this i think one of the way to bring it one of the ways to bring it to a head is the difference i go out into the sun and i close my eyes now the sun overcomes the, the, the actual photons. They're overcoming great lengths to tan my skin. And that is they're touching my skin. The skin tan is one of actuality. It's because I'm there exposing myself in the sun. But as soon as I open my eyes, now there's a field of possibilities. I mean, even though they're both amount to chemical processes of the eyes, or uh, I'm sorry, of the uh, different photons, you know, in one sense interacting with my eyes, in one sense interacting with my skin, and both can be reduced to chemical analysis. The phenomenological difference between seeing this, I can, if I fall asleep with, you know, my, my eyes closed, I can get a nasty burn. But if I open my eyes, my eyes are going to be one of the few places that are going to give me a quick place of where I can locate shade and hide from the sun. Hmm. Uh -huh. So, I mean, my eyes clearly afford a realm of possibilities. And if there's possibilities, that means it's not a concatenated chain of just everything unfolding. There has to be something like, at the very least, organismal complexity looping in upon itself. The more organisms have more and more, so this is sort of the strange loop stuff that Douglas Hofstetter says, you know, as soon as you start to get to touch and then smell and then taste and then hearing and then sight and then forms of language and then communication technologies, it's this multifolded, very, very complex horizon field of different possibilities. Um, so, I mean, I think, right. That's where you'd have to get at a lot of the non-reductionism. So, you know, um, the reason that I, I defend some version of panpsychism is that um, I think that ultimately to understand human consciousness, we're, we're, under, we're trying to grapple with the, uh, yeah, we want to do detailed phenomenology for each of, each of the sensory modalities, but consciousness itself is some kind of synesthetic um, um, integration. And um, so that becomes a new site for, for inquiry. How does this synesthesia happen? And for me as a, as a uh, defender of panpsychism, I mean, generally I don't like isms and the whole problem with defending isms is, um, you know, you think I'm, I'm suggesting that a crown or uh, a pen or a rock is conscious and that's not really 
So what I would, what I would say about um, the form of panpsychism that I want to take seriously is that um, somehow in order to account for consciousness in humans, we have to understand how all of these sensory modalities, which do seem to uh, be, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a development towards more, um, more complexity and the emergence of complexity, I guess is a way to put it. But somehow, like even sight and language, for, for, for me in a panpsychist cosmology, they must have been implicit or in germ from the, the very first expression of, of being, the very first being. And it, we, maybe we want to call that a quark or a, pro, a photon or an electron, whatever the first primate organism was, to use Whitehead's term. Yeah. And that primate organism, yeah, had very little in the way of like semiosis or potentiality to do something um, completely novel. In, in general, an electron or a photon is going to repeat what just happened. And that's, you could say, a primitive form of touch. So ultimately, my panpsychism would push feeling like touch all the way down in some primitive, to some primitive level where it's equivalent at that point to like what we might mean by causality. Causality is the transmission of feelings. If it's not the transmission of feelings, then how do we even begin to make sense of what ca causality is? And then one more thing is that in terms of how space-time gets brought forth by organisms, I think this is true also at the subatomic level. And it's not like aggregates, um, like you know, uh, a crown or a rock. They're, these are just collections of um, what I think we can, def they're not organisms, a rock is not an organism, but it's made of subatomic and atomic and, and some chemical organisms, I would say. And at those scales, that's the scale in which like electromagnetic radiation uh, is what brings forth the space time of the cos at cosmological scales. So it's the growth of an electromagnetic event that has created the space and time that, that physical cosmologists are measuring. Just in the same way that individual organisms on Earth inhabit their, their own umwelt and bring forth a spatio-temporal horizon of their own I mean, special making, that's yeah. happening at a cosmic scale. And we're all in an ecology and co-evolving. So these different space-time fields that get brought forth by organisms at all scales, they overlap and they mesh. And it's not like we're all inhabiting totally separate worlds. But so that it's, it's my panpsychism is a vision of the universe as an ecology of co-evolving organisms. And the idea that at some point along that evolution, feeling or uh, experience as such emerged, whereas before there was just collisions between blind particles, I think that's a gap that we cannot close in any other way, but by acknowledging that feeling goes all the way down. I mean, okay, I guess I'll respond to that and say, yeah, I mean, in my own, in my own view, it would be, and again, I would be an emergentist, and mm -hmm. I would say that um, I, in, in my emergentism, which is, I, you know, sort of like what David Long was talking about is like the mathematical, you know, for me, there was a kind of logical paradox that was entailed by the one, the one couldn't exist. And for unknown and unknowable reasons, and that's what Harding says, for unknown and unknowable reasons. Yeah that somehow, and it's, it's part of like the cabal, you know, but that, that the, the Kabbalistic thinking that, you know, mm -hmm. there is- Or Neoplatonism in general, yeah. Or like, like, you know, in, in order, how do I say, it? that in order for it to be anything at all, it had to introduce non-being so that it could have the self-relation or that it could be delimited or it could have something rather than nothing. Um, because even if there was something rather than nothing, that something isn't anything until there's nothing along with it. I mean, there has to be something to differentiate it, to delimit it, to, to specify mm -hmm. and to allow self-relation or, or the distance to come back to itself. So there's like a logical entailed problem there. And yeah. so I think there is a sense of, yes, given that the best of our knowledge, there was a big bang and the universe evolved and it does have a date and we are undoubtedly self-conscious, the universe must have always had the, the metaphysical possibility of such given to it. It's not yeah. proof 
that the universe had to be self-conscious, but were proof that it metaphysically had the possibilities there. I mean, and, and again, not that they were temporally there, quotes, all along, like each of us, you know, the, the particular scene was produced by our fathers was not, you know, wasn't even produced yeah, I mean, you go back just a couple of, you know, weeks. But, would, but you would agree to, to say, to, to make, to give the sense that time has any meaning at all, we have to imagine an experience of the time. So, like, there wasn't a time before experience, right? We need an experience. We need an orderliness. And I think there's an orderliness to me, mm -hmm. which is a natural orderliness. And, like, here would be one way to get at it, you know. In, in Bergson, you know, I'm doing a lot of stuff on Bergson. And I'm not a Bergson scholar, but I really do like the stuff he does on the knot and on the problem of knot in yeah. a Mind and Matter, I think. It's, it's in Mind and Matter. And he says, um, you know, if I take if I take an object, I get my... Matter and Memory, I think, is the title, right? Matter and Memory, is that the one? Matter memory, right. Uh, if I... Um, if I take the, oh no, it's creative evolution. I think it's in creative. Mm. Trying to think. Okay. At any rate. So if I take a, if I take the, the pen, if I try to affirm the pen and I look at it and I give an affirmation of it, I, I recognize its properties. I recognize perhaps its density, its weight, its presence before me, like there it is. But if I try to negate the object, the content of my consciousness in negating it is actually larger than affirming it because to negate it, I have to infer, I have to affirm the entire context in which its absence is now being postulated. That mm -hmm. is the content of an affirmed negation that yeah. is, of a negation is larger than an affirmation. So you could imagine like in like speculative sort of philosophy where this logical paradox imagined what it would be like to yeah. not be and thereby so, made more than itself than it could have had but it literally introduced nothing to itself but yes. there a lot <laughs> Can, let's make a distinction here that whitehead makes that i think would be helpful for you maybe to understand my pan, <clears throat> my panpsychism he distinguishes between consciousness and experience and says that consciousness is specifically that mode of experience which which is obsessed with negation, which is, it's that consciousness is the awareness of the, he calls it the affirmation negation contrast. And it's aware of possibility in a way that is more imaginatively free than any other mode of experience that precedes it evolutionarily. So Whitehead distinguishes between conscious experience, which is what you're talking about, and experience in general, which is not aware of negation in the same way, which is more stuck in the actual, but that still nonetheless participates to some degree in the potential. No, I agree with that. No, I agree yeah. with that. For me, I would just say it this way. I mean, my, my, in my language, it would be time, the thought is that kind of time that inherently deals with what is not or could be or is possible. That, uh, and, and we call that kind of time eternity, you could say, right? That only dealt in actuality would be no thought at all. Right. Thought has to deal in possibilities. Now, a thought, a particular thought, is an actualized horizon of possibilities, but there have to be possibilities that generate that actualized thought. Right, uh, right. That's why that's why Whitehead is a Neoplatonist and still affirms something like eternal objects. So I mean, okay. So let's, let's so we get at that. So I mean, I think here, here would be some ways that I would come at. The, in, 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 I, I'm going to try to set this up, but I mean, here would be the question that I want to get to you. But I'm going to see if I can get to you to get to this question. Is you know, you you've said in some of your videos that the emergentist position ends up with an epiphenomenalist account. That is, they end up with. Yeah like consciousness trailing behind and it's not able to causally get in, in the world. And I've already tried to address some of that with the stuff on the senses. Well, but there's weak and strong emergence, right? And the weak emergentist yeah. becomes epiphenomenalism and the strong emergentist, I think, becomes a dualist because they're saying, okay, there's downward causation. Well, what is this separate thing that's downwardly causing the brain and the body to do things? I just gave the example of how the different sensory capacities furnish expansive horizons of space and time for the yeah. 
possibilities to be actualized. And each one of those, I think, is arguably emergent. And we could give the documentation. So this is where Lynn Margulis' stuff on symbiogenesis, the eukaryote invasion. I mean, it's because I think part of the issue of telos has to do with ontogeny. And, you know, th is there a telos in organisms? Well, organisms visible to the naked eye. I don't know if there is in bacteria. You know, bacteria- just Chemotaxis. I mean, if there's taxis, there's telos, I think. <laughs> I don't know. We'd have to have that argument. You know, that okay. I think, you know, the notion of growth and death, that is the Darwinian players in evolution of sex and death are basically their grounds for ontogeny. And even Aristotle, you know, Aristotle's notion of telos has a lot to do with entelechy and it would be multicellular complexities like the acorn to the oak. You know, this is an ontogeny of an organism. It's nothing like, you know, Lynn Margulis says it beautifully. You and I are more similar to a fern than you or I or the fern are similar to anything bacteriological. I mean, this, <laughs> these organisms are really, really, I mean, we're really different than these. Yeah. Okay, but here, here would be the, the, the way to come at this issue would be when I was very young, I was convinced that there had to be something that was unchanging because otherwise, if all reality was changed, then the change would be imperceptible. And again, this was, it was like, like, you know, that was the naivety of my youth. I thought, you know, look, if, if all reality is change, and I think all reality is change, all reality is change. Everything is changing at all points. But... You don't need something unchanging in order to register that. That's the sophomoric mistake. What you right. need is differing rates of change intersecting and where differing rates of change intersect, it creates horizons where objects can be experienced as meaningful things and no longer just changing events. So when Dewey says, when communication occurs, events turn into objects, things with a meaning, we could see like reality. And again, if you can use the white heading thing, there's lots of different kinds of information or communication going on at different, you know, orders through nature. And those different kinds of communication allow for intersecting different rates of change that produce objects at least objects that could be meaningful, recognized, thought about, but they're really just kinds of events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dewey says produce, they produce objects as like the objects emerge. Whitehead says they, ingre they ingress, objects ingress, and that when we are able to recognize the same object um, at different times, it's, it's the recognition of something that didn't just emerge in time, but that is ingressing from a realm of possibility. Um, and that time itself, uh, there couldn't, we couldn't have it. Whitehead doesn't say there needs to be a fixed point to recognize change. He's a process philosopher. He, he goes even further than, than you did, or at least as you put it, where he would say, it's not just that there's change at every point, it's that the points themselves are, are pure change as well. This is why he has a point-free geometry and a non-metrical Mario-topological understanding of space-time, or I have, we have to say space-times, plural, that's, he puts that as an alternative to, um, he puts it forward as an alternative to Einstein's notion of a four-dimensional geometrical manifold. Um, so, but the, but the point here is, um, yes, um, all things flow and what it is to flow is to arise out of a past and perish into a future. Yeah. Um, and maybe here now we can get back to death. Uh, not, this is all very relevant because if there's a panpsychist cosmos, death is a transition into a new form of life or a different form of life. Whereas if we are in a emergentist cosmos, then death is, um, it's a transition or is it just an end? I mean, I don't know. That's something we would talk about, but. On who you really are. Were you ever really yourself? Were you ever really fully in possession of yourself? You know, so I mean. Yeah. One of the ways to shake out where we just were is it's the difference between a kind of, again, the sophomoric view, which is that things change. And then there's the sophisticated one, which is awkward to say, but it's that change things. There's just change and it things. That is, there's a thinging that's coming out of the ongoing change. And those, those things emerge. I mean, like here would be the problem I would pose to you that you emerged at a certain point in history. And when you emerged, not only did you biologically in a radical sense, 
were you produced by a very unique sperm and ovum, but not, not that ovum may have been there at your mother's birth, but was she there at your grandmother's birth? Was the sperm there at, you know, your father's teenage years? No. So there was a sense in which the, the miraculousness of the particular that you who emerged, that is a strong emergent you. That, I mean, that, that's, it, to me, it's very hard. And, and even there, it's sort of like, you know, we weren't there in the womb going, whoo, is it hot in here? So it's not like consciousness was there. You slowly emerged to self-consciousness, I don't know, about age two one and a half somewhere in there you started to flash in and out and then you know on the other end it'll be like i'm dying i'm dying i'm dying i don't think you ever get to i'm dead so in some sense you know life you know you just get to i'm dying you know but if you get to i'm dead you're not yet and so life is like a mobius strip that only opens to itself from within i don't think in any way it diminishes the sacredness of life or yeah, yeah spiritual post tendency of a person if they suddenly say, I don't believe in life after death. I think too many people, their religious beliefs and spiritual beliefs are a sort of disguised egoism. And this is where the Ernest Becker comes in, is that they're really hanging all of their religious spirituality, not in community, not in fellowship, not in growth of self-understanding, but in something like jockeying for a better position in themselves for an afterlife. Whether it's a Christian dogma and God's there at the pearly gates, or it's they're an atheist atheist and they just believe in the natural continuance of of their own soul it's a disguised dragon holding them from real spiritual potence real spiritual potency of realizing that they partly are other people you're not who you think you are you are other people right the eyes plus hmm. yeah i would fully uh support this notion of emergence of each of us as you know the um, biological beings that we are, you know, each, each of our bodies is like reassembled from, from the cellular molecular level, um, when, when, when we're conceived and, and born and, um, yeah, the germ cells are a little bit older than just our parents maybe, or, or the ovum at least. And so we have this, we're, we're, we're so, but this, for, for, for me, from a Whiteheadian point of view, what you're describing, um, is, is the, uh, inheritance of a um, uh, a pattern or a, a value which has been achieved by the community of, um, of molecules and cells that have evolved over the course of many many generations there's a there's a value a pattern of value being inherited and um, and repeated and that emergence is a great way to describe how what is going on at one scale the type of relationship happening between the molecules within each cell and the type of relationship happening between the cells in each organ uh, and the relationships you know these are all different scales of emergence and so on that on that level yeah emergence is 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 the way we need to describe what's happening the only kind of emergence that i would want to challenge is the idea that you can get the emergence of value out of n nothing yeah. um, or the emergence of feeling out of completely dead inert well, no, no, stuff. It happens. It, 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 you know, it emerges out of the previous stages that were there. You know, I think as anything becomes more complex, it becomes less specialized. I mean, we're so, but, but here's the, the, this is the logical paradox I think you were getting at earlier. And I heard you sort of dwelling in the um, it's the cultural grammar of Neoplatonism ultimately, that is just pervasive in, in all of our thinking in, in different um, East, West, everywhere. Um, it's this idea that there's this one that's beyond being and that, and then it's, it's somehow non-being, but, but the one emanates out and eventually ends up in matter, which is also non-being. So there's like this, there's non-being at the top of the hierarchy, the one, and then there's non-being at the bottom of the hierarchy, matter. And on some readings of that neoplatonic um, emanationist scheme, we'd want to say that, you know, matter's bad, matter's evil. And we, what we want to do is really turn our attention to the one and ascend back to this sense of mystical unity with all things. And, but somehow the, what the paradox I think is calling us to attend to and become aware of is the way that matter is itself um, the best uh, rendition of the one that we could ask for. The, the material universe is itself 
you know, Plato would say it's like the mo it's a moving image of eternity. And if we shouldn't be turning away from the material world, we shouldn't be um, turning away from, from our sensory encounter, our embodied phenomenological encounter with the physical universe in search of something transcendent. We should be turning toward that universe as yeah. itself the best symbol of that transcendence that we could ever ask for. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I think so many people, they're interested in securing something like an eternal immortal soul, which I don't know if there's any evidence for, but they, they can't see the emptiness that they are, that, that emptiness that makes room for everything. You know, when Harding says he was in the Himalayan mountains and he suddenly discovered that he didn't have a head, he wasn't trying to give a theory. I mean, look, you don't have a head. Everyone else does. You know, that's why movies appear so real is because the headless camera works. It allows us to participate in, in a situation by being that situation. You know, I think the thing that I would say to you, and he, he would be the way I would, I would respond to your, and I think there is, there is that, there is a paradox there for sure. Uh, I would say, you know, the reverse paradox, it comes a couple of ways. One is that it's sort of like the panpsychist argument it seems to be falling prey to the age old, why is there something rather than nothing? Because it's like a different thing of saying, well, either the stuff always was or it came out of nothing. There's the same problem with consciousness. Like it's re insinuated is like consciousness always was, or it somehow came out of nothing. It's like, no, I don't think that has to be the case. I think it can actually be that there were possibilities encumbered through forms of geometric tumbling through enough time you know it's, it's like take bread i mean bread when you need it in a certain way if you need it in just the right way and then let it let it go now again there's yeast in it so it gets problematic <laughs> that's a metaphor but i mean yeah. like you know chemical dynamics that go on that allow for you know, change and emergent properties that weren't there before. You know, classic examples would be sodium chloride or take even water. Okay, so Philip Ball's book, uh, Water, a, B, a Brief Biography, you know, the book on, on, on the nature of water. Fascinating book, you know, but you take, you know, water is one of the strangest fluids and it's so strange because we think of water as typical, but it's so rare as far as fluids go. It's one of the very few fluids to expand when it goes to a solid state. And so what's happening is, you know, the molecular bonding of the H2O are fairly loose, right? They're fairly loose, but then when they move to the solid state, it gets, you know, below a certain temperature, depending upon pressure and humidity, whatever, uh, all of a sudden it turns to ice. Well, the molecular bonds become at strict right angles to each other, and then that forces them to expand out, and it takes on, again, new sort of thermal warming properties, all this kind of stuff. But the, the point here is that you know, the wetness of water and the hardness of ice isn't to be found at that molecular level. It's to be found at the emergent level of life that's then interacting with that inorganic compound water. I mean, I don't think water is alive, uh, but I do think that it has certain properties that made life possible on this planet. And so there's a sense in which this is where I guess I, I'm sympathetic to your panpsychism, where if, if we're going to say that there had to be a certain orderliness in order for conscious experience to emerge, and therefore that orderliness was there, and that's part of what we mean by life, well, then hell yeah, it goes all the way back. It's part of the orderliness. But for you, this would be the problem. I would, I would, I would state real quickly that huh. you believe in something like reincarnation, like say this Dalai Lama kind of stuff, like you're going to come back as a different organism or maybe another person, or you were a squirrel in a previous life or whatever. Mm -hmm. This to me, A, amounts to a denial of non-being and B, then I'd go back to your whitehead. Where is this consciousness, which is exercising its awareness of non-being? Somehow that, no, 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 that, that consciousness, which is trafficking in non-being, how is that possible when I'm going from a squirrel to being coming back as a dolphin and, and all this kind of stuff? Hmm. It doesn't make any uh, sense. Yeah, I mean, I think that the uh, Vajrayana and, and Mahayanist Buddhist understandings of like, reincarnation are not that um right easily dismissed i, I don't think they really because if, if the buddhist doesn't believe in the self then what is reincarnating in me that's going to come back as a squirrel so there's there's a lot more to talk about there in terms of what, yes. what various buddhist traditions mean by reincarnation incarnated is the emptiness it's the universally sure. shared 
Yeah. Which makes room for other. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, one thing I would want to clarify is I do not think that consciousness as, as human beings understand it. Um, and as we defined it earlier, I do not think that that was here from the beginning. Um, it is a, it is a historical achievement. And so, but the question then becomes the historical achievement of what accomplished by what? And that's a process of cosmological evolution that accomplished consciousness. And all that I'm saying is that that process of cosmogenesis has had um, aim from the beginning. It has had, um, it, it is tilted toward novelty, tilted toward complexity, and, and also has a, a means of preserving its own past. So that there has been, as Bergson might say, memory has been present since the beginning. The entire universe is in some ways a recording medium. And we now as conscious beings, which emerged with all of our special capacities very late in the game, are becoming sensitive to the medium which gave rise to us. Uh, but the point is that there was music playing from the beginning. And we now have the capacity to participate in the making of music in a way that doesn't appear any other organisms on this planet are capable of. But like, where did we learn to play the music? I don't think we just invented this capacity. And I'm, I think I'm letting the metaphor run away with me now, but. Yeah. Um, Part of the difficulty yeah. is that, I mean, again, I, I'm sympathetic to, you know, is there something like an irritability in the basic protoplasm of life that's resemblance to a, I don't know, and disequilibrium in a chemical state. And I mean, we could get at all this, you know, family resemblances and, and phenomena stuff. But I mean, I think for me, let's just call it the swerve, the Kleinemann. I mean, the Greek atomist, whatever you want to call it. The problem is like for the panpsychist position is what exactly is at stake? Like, I think, you know, when you look at something like SETI, you know, the achievement of value, that's what's at, like yeah. the achievement of beauty, the, the, yeah. I'm interested in, is there life elsewhere? They're mm -hmm. wanting to know, is there set? Like when people, when SETI got a lot of money and people are asking about it, you know, extraterrestrial intelligence or what is artificial intelligence? Will we ever be able to achieve it? When we're asking those kinds of questions, those are very practical. Or if I say, you know, does a tree have enough awareness to communicate through its root structures with neighboring trees about, uh, you know, upcoming nutrients and climates or predators and whatnot? Not, okay, that's one thing. It's another thing to say, okay, now I'm going to cut the log off of the tree and I'm throwing the log in the fire. Am I, is, is, is you know, I mean, those are the, I, mean, I think there's, there's ranges of things, but I think the real issue is that when people are asking about consciousness, I don't know if they're really asking, you know, can we find family? I mean, maybe some are asking these sort of cosmological questions about can we find family resemblances all the way down? I think they're sort of asking, you know, what is it that happened that led to the particular kind of consciousness that we now do experience and enjoy that includes making art, music, the imagination, religion, all this kind of stuff? And will we find that somewhere else out in the universe? Like if we go out somewhere in the universe and we find some water and we find some microorganisms, and even if we find like a bunch of planets that have like bunny rabbits running around, but we don't ever find people making art, I think it's going to disturb people. So I mean, I think there's a, there's a much bigger question being asked when we ask how pervasive and universal is that which we're experiencing right now? Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting question. I, 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 uh, I think that the way that modern people have been imagining the, the universe and the vast expanses of, of, it's not that I don't think there are actually all these galaxies out there, but I, I wonder if the modern understanding of our place in the universe um, is just as sort of culturally constructed, maybe not just as, but in some ways it's a cultural construct in the same way that the medieval cosmos was, and that as science itself advances, we're going to see that, oh, we had a pretty um, confused understanding of how the dimensionality of all of this actually hangs together. Yeah. And whatever we might mean by aliens on some other planet, if, if the structure of space-time is fractal and points, there's non-local connection between points in space and there's entanglement and all this stuff, when we're talking about aliens, intelligences on other planets, we cannot, I think we shouldn't presuppose or assume from the beginning that there's not some way in which we are 
um, in, you know, <laughs> there's not some way in which who we are on this planet Earth is in fact um, that very intelligence that we're trying to find elsewhere on some other planet. That in some ways, this alien intelligence we're imagining is our, is our own um, divine imprint and we're just projecting it outward. And um, so I don't know, I just, I just feel like we shouldn't, um, I'm more and more skeptical, I guess, of the, the notion that the, we even understand what we mean when we talk about alien intelligence yeah. on other planets. Yeah. I mean, what I would want to go to, and again, I, I've done more of this in, in my book, I, was, I would try to go to, you have to get to the history and the institution of money and private property. And that without getting at money and private property, we're never going to get adequately to what death fear is, how how notions of afterlife get tangled in with notions of transcendence. See, I think money, money for Burke is transcendence, pure and simple. You can flip a leper a coin. You can give love at a distance without involvement. Can you clarify where does money begin? Is it coinage or is it like the Sumerian debt, I, grain debt thing that the priests were doing? Like how, where does it begin? I would say it has to begin with representative money. So it's not just... Um, so we're talking like axial age with the, the, the yes, coinage surplus and coinage debting systems you know i mean by the oh. time roman empire you know the roman empire to the best of my knowledge people can feel free to correct me here best of my knowledge they were the first ancient empire to to give up the after six years your debts were clean so mm -hmm. there was a rule in the ancient world that for six years you couldn't collect your money all right you're good you know you don't have the money the, yeah. the romans went no you still owe us and i mean yeah. Social inequality was so bad by the time of Jesus that people thought, you know, we're going to need a supernatural sacrifice. And see, the logic of money is so crucial to understanding the Jesus story and the mythos of Christ, because Christ mm -hmm. dying on the cross is often said as a payment, a sort of redeeming for the sin of another. See, money introduces the notion that one can pay out and have someone else be making atones for the wrongdoings of another. And mm -hmm. money is really caught in that logic of, of, again, making substitutions for wrongdoings. And so the notion of Christ being a payment for the wrongdoing of Adam and Eve, and again, all these notions of just substitutions. I mean, it's very strange to try to explain to people how original sin really all fits into, you know, why, why Jesus has to be made mortal and has to live as a human and how that relates to Adam. I mean, sometimes you got to bring out the tweezers. To, you know, so, you know, you can, you can try to save the, you know, the baby with the bad water, but I think it, it starts to become without getting at the history of money, without, getting yeah. at, you know, the, the lending practices, the, the desire for people to end the rise of social inequality and Christianity promised the impending ending of the world and the making amends for it. And here we are thousands of years later and we're still waiting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what would Jesus do? He'd probably issue a debt jubilee. So that's, uh, <laughs> it's interesting that um, so much of the, um, so much of left-wing politics nowadays, you know, pushing against things like economic inequality and um, uh, racism and stuff, that these are, it almost seems like Christianity without God. Um, and this, this w w which, doesn't really have a transcendent locus of, of value, but more of a horizontal locus of value among the human community. And yes. so it's, it's interesting to see this resurgence. It's a religious impulse that's resurging right now. I think this is partly where you get Jordan Peterson claiming that the left is a bunch of neo-Marxists because it is, it has this Hegelian, you know, young Hegelian, let's bring about heaven on earth here. I mean, mm -hmm. it does have that, that, that spirit. Um, yeah, no, that, that's very interesting. I, I think, the oh god there's just so much on and i on the issue of of clocks calendars literacy like i don't think we could get at what we're experiencing right now as cages and, and and again it's related to death fear i mean all these things are related to death fear that they not only precipitate the kinds of consciousness that can be more and more aware of its own impending non-existence but we have increasingly you know, it's the same sword that cuts, that, that heals the wound. It, it allows us to have forms of transcendence whereby we can leave 
things behind that outlive us and become part of the possibilities for other others, whether it's just things we've said and how we've, you know, helped others along the way, or it's, uh, you know, artistic, scientific accomplishments. It could be, you know, countless ways that we, we fall into a world that's already been created by other people. You know, we didn't yeah. invent any of these technologies that we're using right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, clocks, calendars, all these things, um, money have uh, insulated us in a, a symbolic um, matrix, insulated us from, um, I think, our, the, the, the cosmic sources of meaning that, that gave rise to human civilizations initially, which was like, we literally learned how to, how to farm and we learned mathematics and geometry by like paying attention to the sky. Yeah. And so the, it, this is why Plato says in the laws that like, no, the stars taught us the arts of civilization. We, we learned it from the sky. That's right. Um, and these capacities d developed into, you know, the advanced mathematics that, and, and allowed for this sort of technological mastery that, that civilizations have been able to achieve now. But there's this, there's this original, the, the original, um, impulse for all of this wasn't invented in some guy's head. It actually was the, the cosmological context within which yeah. uh, our species came, came to be. I mean, well, so was, but, yeah. but just in terms of what we might mean by consciousness in the context of um, the universe at, at writ large, I mean, I agree with you when you say like Douglas Harding style, like there's a big hole where my head should be and the universe fills it in. Like, so we are cosmic beings in this sense. And like, as you, I think you put it like, you are the sunset, like you are a node in a network of relations and your consciousness isn't isolated or uh, self-causing. It's like bound up in all of these relationships. And I would say that those relationships extend out and like, who and who are we really? If, if we're thinking about death and what survives, like right now, while we're alive, who are we really? Well, we are really um, aspects of the expressions of the, the earth system. And the earth is, is, is so, itself a, an expression of the, the whole solar system. And this, it's, we're inside of, of the sun's body in, in a way. We're, we're actually inside of the sun, um, sheltered within its protective layers, electromagnetic and, and heat. And we're, we're like, um, we're nested in this a series of, I think or, or organisms right. out, out and on, onto, this, onto this cosmic scale. And whatever we think we are as individual persons um, is, is in some way a, a, a narrowly focused horizon, just the other side of which are these wider perspectives that I do think under the right circumstances with practice or, or sometimes there's chemical means, we can actually tap into these other layers of consciousness. Yeah. And, and, then, and then we come back from those experiences and try to describe them in this human language and consciousness and we mess it up. But I actually do think we were experiencing something. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying there. I mean, I think this goes back to this discussion we were talking about with the water stuff. You know, it's like relations are not things, but they're as real as things. Mm -hmm. And they introduce properties. And so like the sunset, you know, the sunset is not a thing out in the world that happens there independent of observers. No, the sun is always rising and setting simultaneously. But because my body has a forward, I can turn west. And at the right time, given the horizon line, I can make the sunset. Now, you know, like for Harding, yeah, I mean, a sunset may be one of your truest riches, even though it can't be personally possessed. And you start to realize how much of, of our world is that, and I think, you know, a lot of the great religions, as you point out, you know, ancient, the traditional religions, they were founded on seasonality, on stargazes, on, you know, the, the larger cosmos as it was presenting itself, the way the sun and the moon chased each other around. And then as more and more people lived in greater indoor dwellings, urban dwellings that eclipsed the sky, it became harder and harder for moderns to understand those ancient myths. And now as people are like basement dwellers living on their their, their cell phones and in their, their computers, the, the religions seem even further out of touch. It's like they don't know how to really relate to them. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to go back to the death thing here for a second. You know, again, this is, these are all these, a lot of these things are in, in the book, but it's like, 
you know, one of the things I have in there is what I'm calling the new Easter story. And like, and it's, it's a, a, a fiction. At a certain point, I realize you can't argue with Christianity because it's, a, <laughs> you have to tell a different story. You have to tell a different story. So it's, it's new. It's a couple of days before Easter and it's in the, it's in the near future, a couple of days before Easter. And it just so turns out that Jesus himself makes a showing in the dreams of all the devout Christians. And he shows, he says, hey, I got an announcement, important updates. There were missing books in the Bible. There was some confusion. But uh, my father wants to make sure that it doesn't get any further out of hand. So I need to give this update to y'all. And he says, I'm not sure how the confusion started, but only virgin births can have life after death. I mean, to dust you shall return. That's how I was able to come back. I was a virgin birth, right? But, I'm, you know, my father wants to know, can you forgive him now that you've discovered this error and that I'm sorry that you had to be both finite and self, self-conscious self and, and, and aware? You know, it, it was difficult. I thought it was a gift. It got misunderstood, especially when people sort of thought that it was this, you know, afterlife stuff. And then it sort of fades. And then it's a story about, you know, how well people can forgive. And I think there are many people right now who, Matt, in a deep way, their faith has taught them how to hold themselves and others psychologically and emotionally hostage to a fantasy. And they can't accept this life because it's so horrible, because it's so filled with suffering and loss and tragedy and injustice and luck. Those things are so painful to the sensitive soul that they have to imagine there's going to be some sort of amends for it. But that was never promised. And for me, as soon as people are unwilling to accept life, unless it has an afterlife, they're basically an ego grabbed. The, the dragon has grabbed the ego and they don't have real gratitude. That yeah. is, I'm sorry. You know, you, you yeah. get these strawberries, you get to know of love, you get to enjoy fiction and laughter with friends. What should be the price of that? I think death in the end and death acceptance as the ultimate gratuity. Yeah. I mean, who do well, people? They are. Yeah. I mean, Christianity is very old and, and has taken many forms. And I think this modern fundamentalist form of it that uh, is somehow compatible with capitalism uh, and like supports Donald Trump in you know in the United States in the context of the United States, this sort of American evangelical Christianity is um, pretty far removed, I think, from the sort of... Uh, teachings of Jesus that I would want to affirm. And I think your story actually is, is closer to the spirit of what Jesus was really trying to teach than anything that an evangelical church yeah. uh, pastor is generally telling. But so in, 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 in my reading of, you know, the, just actually just the Bible, I mean, there's lots of other books that we might want to bring in to interpret what was going on in, in, in the teaching that Jesus was giving. But my reading was that the idea of the individual immortal soul is not in there at all. What's immortal is the community. Yeah. The life of the community and your devotion to that community creates a sort of immortality that allows you to participate in an immortal life. That's not your individual ego. It's the Christ in you and Christ is the community. I'm going to say I, that's much closer to the read that I would give. That's, a, that's in this, the individualism, it's like an Randianism and, <laughs> You know, what's one of the more interesting books I read recently was uh, Harari's book, uh, Sapiens. Hmm. It's a wonderful part in there, if you saw it, but he said the wonderful part in there about the Industrial Revolution. And he says, you know, most people are underestimating what actually happened during the Industrial Revolution. They make it seem, they cover over that history, and then they make it seem as if the individual and the state are at war with one another. And you get this kind of weird libertarian arguments where like, oh, I'm an individual and the state is there infringing upon my freedoms and stuff. And it's like, mm -hmm. the truth couldn't be further from that story. I mean, that's just like oh. so bizarre because we're really happened was, I mean, the family bonds were absolutely authoritative before the Industrial Revolution. If you wanted to beat your kids senseless, that was your prerogative. You wanted to sell your kids into slavery, so be it. You wanted to kill your kids, 
that was your, that your prerogative, man. And you can do whatever. And then the state showed up and went, no, you have to educate your kids. You can't beat your kids' senses. You can't marry that girl off when she's like 11 to your uncle. You can't do all that. And so the individual really was liberated out from the tyranny of the family and tradition by the state. The state and the individual are strange, like co-partners to underestimate this way the state liberated the individual from the family is yeah. what sort of misunderstandings that you see in sort of contemporary libertarian talk but it's not just the state right it's also the 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 corporation the capitalism in conjunction with the state wanted to liberate individuals from these family ties to create good worker consumers oh for sure no it gets right. very complicated yeah it becomes a farm i mean the state starts to farm individuals as it liberates them from their more <laughs> earlier undomesticated yeah well i'm i'm trying to undermine yeah but it's still, you know, there was a different kind of tyranny replaced. It wasn't this happy-go-lucky individual who somehow was trampled on by the state. No, there was one form of tyranny was replaced by another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I was just trying to undermine the libertarian argument that imagines that the state and the market have somehow ever existed apart from one another. Yeah. Uh, and the way that we're seeing increasingly a sense of, it's called regulatory capture, right? Where corporate interests actually buy politicians and write their own legislation to be passed okay. by, by Congress and state houses. And so there's a way in which the libertarian fantasy of like, oh, if only we could just let the market do its thing as if the market and corporations could, could have ever existed outside the context of um, the nation state and the power of the state to enforce contracts now, I don't disagree with that, but I would go, this is where you got to do this sort of deep, you know, media ecological work on how money and literacy are absolutely essential for the growth of those kinds of institutional apparatus that without money and literacy, you don't have the fully functional anonymous individual. You don't have all the trappings that may, I mean, in some way it's just obvious. You can't have capitalism without money. You can't really have huge bureaucracies without literacy. You can't. Yeah these sort of, you know, functional parts sort of irreplaceably configured to interlock. I mean, all that, it just grows out of those. And today I think we're, we're so much more ruled by legalistic culture, you know, non-disclosure mm -hmm. agreements, fine print. It's all this kind of crap, you know, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know what's happened to, to genuine ethics. You know, I think genuine ethics have sort of fallen by the way, and communities fallen by the wayside as individual stab and grab. You know, I think partly people have the scorched earth politics and are going, you know, screw it, my time is limited. And they're fearing there isn't even going to be a community. Like, like I remember when it used to be grandparents and parents would say, oh, it sucks to grow old. If only I could be young again. Increasingly old people go, I would never want to be any younger. And they're sort of like, oh, I feel sorry for you kids today. They do this kind of stuff. It's so different than people throughout history in their old age have went, oh, the lament of you guys going to go on in this world without me now. I don't think people have that anymore. They're kind of like, phew, I'm, I'm, I'm functionally going to leave because the show's almost over. Mm. There's, there's something deeply um, <laughs> depressing to me about how many people are dying alone, like now, from, from because of COVID. They're, maybe they're dying of something else, but their families can't really come visit yeah. before they die. And it's like uh, the individualization of death and the, 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 it's, it's like such a heightened sense of like guilt for one's own existence that like we deal with our own deaths almost alone now. And it's yeah. like in the whole, I think in the 20th century is when like the whole notion of a funeral home, like you pay someone else to take the bodies away and prepare them. And that used to be something the families were doing to their dead. And we're just so um, isolated in, a, in this experience of bodily existence and death that um i just feel like there's a there's a <laughs> it just brings to light the, the the extent of the crisis that we're facing culturally that we've become so fragmented and what where are, are there forms of cultural renewal like what when what, what would they look like to help us step out of this would it mean like literally putting the screens away and how do you do that in the context of a pandemic yeah what, what do, how do we how do we heal from this isolation I, I don't know it's it's a nightmare i mean i had a dream last night that masks were here to for good and i was I, it was in a dream it was like in the whole dream was like wow we're never going to get rid of masks now and you know 
there could be a vaccine. I know mean, Russia announced a vaccine. There could be a vaccine. You could have a different thing break out any day now. Factory farming being what it was, all the deforestation, all the animals. I mean, the conditions are being ripe for another pandemic right around the corner. It's not like there's there's any way that this is going to I mean. We're right now getting the training wheels for learning how to deal with this kind of stuff. Right. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like this isn't just COVID nineteen. This is this is a, this virus is a spillover effect of habitat loss, and and yes. we're gonna we're not slowing that process down. So this is just the beginning. Because I mean, I think the 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 powers that be, the the wealthy and the administ you know the administration, they successfully had people buy the narrative that either you have to kill yourself or kill the economy. And instead of just saying, okay, we're gonna right now start taxing the billionaire class because there's no other way for us to all survive together. Instead, they just do this ridiculous, horrible measure. Like, you know, I, I heard- Well, uh, look what's happening, yeah. David Brooks basically declared it was probably the worst decision in US policy during a, a pandemic. I mean, the rest of Europe, when the, when the lockdown happened, it's like in March, they basically gave stimulus relief to employers and said, you have to keep your employees. They already had insurance because insurance is separate from employment. And the US has created a nightmare. Everyone's panicked going, let me go back to my work. I'd rather die than be without my insurance, without my money. And then the Republicans were able to sell that narrative that, yeah, it's, you know, and it's so funny because when they issued the, the, the money, they went, well, we have to we have to issue these checks because there are a lot of people who lost their jobs and it wasn't any fault of their own. You want to go, oh, this is the first time in history when someone wasn't wealthy from their own, you know, like, like, all, everyone who's poor, they deserve to be poor, except for this one time right here in 2019, 2020, huh? Yeah, as if we're not precariates, like, or, or just in poverty, trying to desperately sell our labor for like starvation wages, as if we have a choice when we get fired. Oh, it's um, but yeah, I mean, look what's happening here. There's a symmetry between the way that, um, you know, the, the U.S. government treated its workers and its, its, its people during this pandemic and the way that the billionaires who are the success stories of our capitalist economy, I guess, what are they doing with all that money? Well, Jeff Bezos is like, I can't think of anything better to do than to waste it on a trip to Mars. And, and Elon Musk, the same thing. And it's like, wait a minute. And then if that's the aim of capitalism, it's like, it's this whole notion that basically the earth is here for us to use up because we can just go somewhere else and, and then use that up. And it's, just, uh, and nope. it's a very naive right. mentality because we're actually, we're turning the earth, this beautiful living planet into Mars as a result of industrial capitalism. We're, we're, yep. we're at the point now where, yeah, we're going to have to wear masks or maybe eventually fucking spacesuits on our own damn planet because we've so messed up the, the atmosphere and the ecosystem, so. I think there's some sense of sour grapes in the endless pursuit of comfort and convenience and ease. Like, I think at a certain point, food only tastes so good. If you're not hungry, it, I don't care how fancy it was. You know, Epictetus says, you know, hunger is the best sauce. You know, the appetite. <laughs> It's the best sauce, you know, uh, f you know, chairs only get so comfortable. Today's billionaire and millionaire, they're caught consuming largely the same entertainments. They're watching, you know, the, the football game. Maybe they have a box seat. Well, we have big screen TVs from our house. So like there, there's a kind of sour grape like irritation. I think a lot of these people, they don't really have good family relations. Like the, the irritation that so many people who are like frustrated with like the companionate marriage. They're, they're frustrated. Like they want men and women to not like each other for the guy to pay the rent and for the woman to do the cooking and this real hierarchical arrangement. They don't, they don't like this idea of the companion and the people getting along. And they, they just, you buy a, buy a pretty bride. I mean, there's a whole, <laughs> Like there's a kind of alienation that's come from, you know, it's what Joseph Campbell says, you've, you've been climbing your, the corporate ladder your whole life only to realize your ladder's against the wrong wall. You know, there's this sense yeah. which I think a lot of people have accrued a great amount of wealth. They've poisoned their friendships. They have very little real community, real friendships. They know that they're caught enjoying the same crap. And now there's a bitterness of, well, this is all I have. And so I'm just going to pursue it. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's like a poison, like of a drug addict who's abusing themselves. They don't know how to get out, but they're caught with like this money addiction. 
They don't yeah. have the courage to need little. It's like an existential failure to imagine that the multi-million dollar home and the fancy caviar and wait till people see you bring out these olives are somehow going to bring happiness to your life. Yeah. I think it's, it's ultimately, we, we turned away from death because we were afraid that death was our end, our purpose, and that the meaning of life comes through, from facing death. We turned away from that and sought meaning in all these other things. And there's really no meaning there. No. Um, and really all we're doing is projecting the, the numinosity of death that's like behind us that we've turned away from onto all these objects that we imagine grant us some immortality. But yeah. um, the only immortality that we might possess will come from squarely facing death in the face. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's, that's a way to maybe get at some of this, maybe to, I don't know how much more time we have here, but, but it's sort of like, I mean, I think this goes back to our, our very opening discussion as I think there's a, a real key and important distinction between the death of the deathbed that is the moment of biological cessation when my, my ontogeny is terminating and my organs give up in this versus death as an ontological horizon that bestows meaning to the human across their entire lifespan. That is meaninglessness, that is the depression, the anxiety, the, the sense that one's life doesn't have a purpose, that's only possible because of awareness of death. That is mortality as state of human consciousness, then that is the necessary precondition for meaning itself, for the desire for art, for finding nature beautiful. I mean, nature has its beauty partly because it's transient. Its transience is being registered and echoed by the fact that we know we're gonna die. And we know that every beautiful sunset, every beautiful arrangement, it's, it's fleeting, its beauty is that echo of our own you know, finitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's like the, the beauty of, of, um, um, of Bach, uh, uh, the beauty of any, any melody or song, you have to be able to let go of the notes you just heard in order to anticipate the notes up ahead and, and to really hear what's being, you know, uh, what's, what's resonating in the present. You have to be able to let go. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we're so um, clenched. I mean, this is the Buddhist thing, right? Uh, suffering is the result of attachment. And there's an attachment to an illusory sense of substantial existence as if the ego was somehow the ultimate locus of, of our existence. Yeah. And we're attached to that idea. And so we ignore the, the beauty of the relationships that we are embedded within and the responsibility we have to those that came before us and the very nature of suffering as a birth process. And that, that we are always being born and dying. And yeah. whether that's at the scale of our entire life or the scale of each daily round of the Earth's <laughs> rotation, which is our larger body, yeah. uh, this is, these are cycles of death and rebirth that we are embedded within. And the only grand identity that we might find that would be worthwhile would be would come through participation in those cycles and not from an attachment to some imagined sense of separate I mean, identity. Earlier discussion of music, I think, you know, it's sort of Alan Wattsy, but yeah, I mean, you don't get, you don't yeah. really appreciate music by getting to the end of the song. You don't dance to get to the last step. You know, mm -hmm. there, I mean, and this is where eschatology, like in some way is the greatest hoax that's ever been played upon people. You know, like I remember my grandma, my grandma would say to me when I was a little kid, she'd say, boy, when I die, I sure got some questions for God. I, I got to have my questions answered. And she had this sense it like, she felt like she knew she was going to get to meet God, talk with God and have her questions answered. Mm -hmm. And I just think, you know, that's a nice thought, you know, and I don't know. I mean, maybe that, maybe that could happen. I, I, I don't think it will. I mean, I, I, part of me is just like, that's ridiculous. Uh, but I think it's, it's like people are going to have to realize that if they're going to bring about anything like genuine justice and compassion and resonate with the beautiful harmony all around them, it's going to be here and now. Uh, when you're dead, you never get to tell your friends you're sorry after you're dead. I mean, you, you have to do it here in the live time. I mean, we, we need social justice 
for one another for our wrongdoings here now. We can't wait for God to clean it up in the afterlife. I think there are a lot of people who they quell the anxiety. It's not as if I say, well, let's let's give our, our money away and we're gonna, you know, we're all gonna try to work for social welfare. I think immediately questions come up like how practical is that and who's gonna pay for it? And you know, aren't these people needing to work for this and all that kind of stuff? But in the back of their mind, even if it's subtly there, is this well, they're going to have an even easier time to get into the afterlife because, you know, God loves a poor working man. And if they're true in their heart, again, people rationalize it like no tomorrow. Their own thoughtless neglect, their own selfish injustices, somehow the thought of an all-powerful God who can make amends for it later, it helps them sleep better at night. I think mm. if you could literally get rid of that, suddenly you'd have people thrown into an all just absolute anxiety, gut-wrenching panic. Not that they give up all their money, but they go, you know what? I only need so much. And I yeah. want, I want to, it's not right to have multi-million dollar homes that are, you know, what they're, they're occupied a couple of weeks a year when somebody's having a party while other people are starving. I mean, if, if everyone had food, oh, have your yacht, have your, have a basketball court on your yacht. Fine. There are people starving though. What the hell is wrong with people? They have this logic of that people deserve it. I mean, you know, you were talking about the religious people. I'm over here. I have Calvinists all around here. Mm -hmm. They think if you're poor, it's because God has already chosen you for hell. And if you're wealthy, it's because God wants you up visiting him in the afterlife. It's they're, they're crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's so important to recognize the the psychology of death denial and the impact that it has on shaping our our economic system. Because on the one hand, as you're saying, like we could approach this from the policy side and try to uh, change the way that capitalism functions and how money flows and who's taxed and all of this, who has health care. But at the end of the day, there's, I mean, I wouldn't want to privilege the need to address these psychological issues over the need for structural like legislative change. We need both. But if you just do the structural change, you're still going to have a bunch of people with wounded psychologies who are clinging to this idea of a personal afterlife and, and judging the whole political arrangement based on their fantasy. Yeah. And so it's like, yeah, we need to address this psychology and but give people so there's this religious impulse that I think is valid. Not only is it valid, it's instinctual. So we can't get rid of it even if we wanted to. It's this desire to partake in some form of immortality. And so the question is, what form of immortality can we partake in? That's where that's what culture emerges in order to address. Yeah. And our culture is so sick, precisely because the forms of immortality it imagines are toxic to the life process. <laughs> yeah, uh, they destroy individual lives, and they're destroying the ecosystem, right. of this planet, because there's this greedy, uh, just constant eating of everything in sight uh, without any any sense of the future without any sense of the suffering of others and so um, how do we imagine alternative forms of participation in immortality that do justice to this religious instinct and this need yeah for that that isn't feeding consumer capitalism and yeah, I think you're right. All of this comes down to policy, man. We need to change policy. Get rid of, you know, Citizens United has to go. We need to start thinking about, you know, jeering yeah. laws, you know, making voting a national holiday. I think there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff there that really has to happen. But I mean, I think going back to the, the you know, the psychological dimension there, it's, I think part of the poison, and I think this is, you know, you can find it in Nietzsche's work, but I mean, part of the poison happened in the New Testament with the all good, all loving God. That's where the, the seductions to the, the mawkish ego got, it, it sort of got fed and then the dragon saw that door open and rawr, just the defenses came in. Um, because I think if you take something like, take the, the account of, of Noah and the rainbow from, from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, and this goes back to even the Garden of Eden story, but in the Old Testament, the, the, the Jewish people understood God as somehow responsible for the situation they were in. And they imagined God sort of felt guilty for some of it. Like, not that he felt like he'd done wrong, but he knew what he had done. And like, when he drowned in everybody out and he went, oh, you know, I made a little bit of an overreaction here. I'll put a rainbow in the sky to remind you I'm not gonna do that again. So there uh -huh. you 
God kind of giving an apology, right? But when you go up to your average Christian today and you say, can you forgive God? And they'll say, what do you mean forgive God? You know, God forgives you. You know, you're, you're a sinner. God's all good, all loving. You want to go, wait a second, wait a second. I didn't ask to be born. There's a lot of hardship, a lot of injustice, a lot of suffering. And I'm pretty sure there's not going to be life after death. Now, if there's yeah. no life after death, can you still forgive God? And I think it almost leaves them stymied because I think they want to say, no, God doesn't need any forgiveness. And yet they're lying to themselves. They know damn well because when they say, I accept Jesus, I accept Jesus in my heart. And they say, haven't you heard the good word? The good word is that God sent his only son to be sacrificed, to make amends for original sin and all the sins of humanity. So in other words, you do recognize a guilty God. Why else, why else stress he's sacrificing his only son? He's an all powerful God, can only have one son. No, it's stressing the sacrifice that this is. And it's also stressing that if people say, when they grab their heart and they go, well, I accept Jesus, what they're really going is, I can only accept this world when it's promised to have something other than this. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting the way, I mean, again, the way I read the New Testament uh, that's amending the Old Testament is, you know, Jesus himself says, like, I'm here to replace the law, the old tribal law with universal love. And so the whole notion of um, what's unique about Jesus's teaching as a Jew is to say to the Jews and everybody else, look, your tribal gods are not relevant to this universal God of love, which, yes, the, and then the Christian mythos, the story about, about Jesus as the sacrifice to uh, atone for the sins of all people. It's really all people. It's not just for Jews. It's not just for this people or that people. And, but there's a way that uh, a lot of modern Christians have just reverted to tribalism as if God's on their side, as if God takes sides. Yeah. And it's just a way of imagining God that seems to me to have everything to do with the Old Testament conception of tribal religion and nothing at all to do with what Jesus was actually trying to teach. Well, it's also, I mean, I think there's a kind of weird ahistoricism where people act as if, well, the Old Testament, that's a bunch of weird stuff. I don't know what to say about that. Now, the New Testament is all I really believe in. Well, if all you believe in is New Testament, then none of the book makes any sense. Jesus right. I mean, you have to go back to why was Jesus needing to be born at all? Yeah. Yeah. And there's a sense in which it, it, you know, I think for the, and it's, I'm not advocating, you know, a literalist interpretation. I'm suggesting that the earliest peoples, the crafters of that, that text that we know as the Bible, they could only imagine something like a guilt ridden God. That is a God who put people in this very precarious situation of being both self-aware and finite. And they needed some way to create a myth that allowed them to persist without psychologically snapping. Happen to yeah. to continue on in that, you know. Well, I think you said earlier that um, you don't want to compete with Christianity. You just want to imagine alternatives. But given the number of people who are stuck in this psychological drama response to the Christian religion, I think we actually need to work within these stories yeah. and symbols and myths and like try to offer alternative interpretations because it's it's rich stuff. It's it's literature. You're not supposed to take literature literally, but you're supposed to read it and work with it. And I think there's a lot of resources there for actually imagining something. I mean, as you do in your book with Jesus and the story that you tell. Jesus showing up saying, look, it was only virgin births. If, yeah. if you were a virgin birth, there'll be the afterlife for you. But if you weren't, to dust you shall return. Right. Yeah. So... That's great. I, I think uh, 1230, I'm going to have to run here. So I don't know uh, if you're still watching any of this. Matt, it was so great to talk with you. It's always so fun. Likewise, uh, this was a lot of fun. And, um, you know, I think I look forward to reading your book. And Thanks. there's another level of, of uh, like intricacy and detail we could get into in writing. Um, yeah. You know, I've published a bit on some of the stuff we were talking about. And uh, I think, uh, you know, that's another avenue for us to take. I think these dialogues are awesome, but to really understand one another, I think um, the written texts actually bring us to a deeper level. Oh, for sure. For mm -hmm. sure. I mean, that's <laughs> right. I mean, the, the, the letter, it killeth and it give birth to new level. I mean, the, the whole, the, the way that the written word kills the spoken word in order to resurrect it at a more transcendent plane is quite fascinating. Yeah, exactly. The so. repressed, 
memory that's being recognized in some of our religiosity. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the last time we did a dialogue like this was six years ago. So okay. let's make the next one not Be as long. <laughs> that's good, Matt. Well, you All take right. care of yourself. It was really great seeing you. And I look forward to our next one. Likewise, Corey. Okay, take care.